when I was called uh, to, to do this uh, program uh, by uh, Mr. Lauder, I think that's what I call, uh, I said, you know, it, it would interest me. I, I'd, be, I'd be happy to do that, but I'm not a big Emily Dickinson fan. <laughs> and uh, and I and I'd really have to start you know going into work and reading it. well hey, that's not what you, what you have to do he says just it's an honor of her and I says well uh, okay that that sounds good let, let, let me re rethink of that so uh, <coughs> I want to start by saying I, that I I've never been a great fan of, of Emily's but uh, but that's my problem and and I have I have a hard time with Henry James as well but uh, you never you never know when a writer uh, make him knocking on your door and or keep knocking on door to you. Finally, let him or her in, only to discover that uh, you don't want to let them go. You know, and that's happened to me uh, many times, and it continues to happen. So uh, you know, they brought bring something to your life, and you need it at just the right time, and uh, and you want to, to keep on bringing it. Uh, this uh, year in June at the clearing, I'm going to teach uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald. I was never a great F. Scott Fitzgerald fan, and started reading him about a half a year ago and have read just about everything he's written at this point and discovered, uh, well, in high school, when I, when I taught on that level, everybody would be teaching at the Great Gatsby. And I found, yeah, man, it's a boring book, and he's a boring guy, you know. Uh, why would I teach that? I would have to teach something about Russian literature or black literature, or something of that sort. But uh, then I really gave uh, the Gatsby a, a couple of good reads and thought, this is a great book. This is really good. Look, and this guy's a very good writer. And Hemingway had no right to keep poking his finger at him all the time. In fact, I like to tell all him, you know, I think Fitzgerald was better than you. <laughs> but uh, uh, I won't get into that. So uh, anyway, Hem Emily and uh, and Henry, uh, among others, keep knocking on my door. And one of these days, I, I, may, I may let them in, and we'll see what happens. How do you? I mean, how do people live without any thought? Said Emily Dickinson. There are many people in the world, you must have noticed them on the street. How do they live? How do they get strength to put on their clothes in the morning? I think about that a lot. How do people live without books, without art, without music, without a life of the mind? What I'd like to leave my kids and grandkids more than anything else would be curiosity. There's something I hope, uh, all of this is something I hope to address tonight, though my mind, uh, what's left of it these days, may wander. So uh, bear with me, or as I mentioned, doze off if it becomes too boring or too confusing. And then again, a, a writer's mind is, is always wandering. It's curious, it's questioning, and he writes because he's trying to discover just who the hell he is. And for a moment, this moment, he's got poetry on his mind. Is poetry the question, the answer? When and how does it enter our lives? What do we do with it? And what does it do to us? Not knowing when the dawn will come, I open every door, said Emily Dickinson. Now, I like that. There's some poetry for you. That's where and how a writer should begin and continue opening every door. Okay, I've got only uh, so many minutes to say something that might be meaningful and way too many doors. So which ones do I open? I dwell in possibility, said Emily. Let's start with the past. I was raised in a house of prose. Take your shoes off. Can't you see I just washed the floor? Close the door. You're letting all the cold air in. You live in a barn? You think money grows on trees? Wash up, it's time to eat. I don't care if you don't like to eat green beans, eat them anyway, they're good for you. Remember the poor children starving in China. <laughs> Hang up your clothes. When's the last time those shoes of yours saw some polish? Get your pajamas on, time for bed. When's the last time you went to confession? Nobody spoke poetry. Nobody read poetry. Nobody knew what the word poetry meant. There were no bookshelves in my house of prose. There were no books. But there were newspapers. There was a radio. And on the radio, there were voices and music, popular songs that my mother would sing in the kitchen, and songs of the old country aired on an ethnic radio station 
which she sang along in, in Czech. Poetry has a way of invading our lives when we are least aware of it, however it may be expressed. There were poetic occasions as well, weddings, baptisms, birthdays, anniversaries, funerals, when the body burst into uncontrollable emotions, bubbling into joy, and laughter, tears, pure poetry, and whatever words one could dredge from a prosaic mind that felt, meant, and sounded a little like poetry. Uh, hidden, disguised, to be found in foreign sounds. There were two languages in my house of prose, English and Czech. Come to think of it, there were, there were three, English, Czech, and Latin, learned by rote in school and church. Think about that Latin mass, which was kind of the equivalent of Homer's Odyssey, or a long day journey into altars and sanctuaries, flickering vigil candles, clouds of incense, the ringing of bells three times, bread and wine, stained glass windows, statues of saints, the infant of Prague, the Blessed Virgin, bloody crucifixes and stations of the cross, <coughs> silver chalices and golden tabernacles, Sersum Corda, lift up your heart, sings a priest, regale in a wonder of glowing vestments, in nominee, Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. I left the church at the age of 15, but the poetry of the church never left me. I think it was Tallulah Bankhead, as I recall, who rejected Catholicism, but called it great theater. <laughs> Language in the house of prose continued. Where are you going? The child would ask his father, dressing to go out somewhere after dinner. And the father would smile, reply and check, the paddle la bêche keeping the old language in the family, leaving the American child locked out, speechless, as both parents maybe smiled, sometimes broke into laughter. The poetic sound of another language, another tongue, the secrecy of languages, the potency of words. I know something in a world that has as much power, or I know nothing in a world that has much power as a word, said Emily Dickinson. Sometimes I write one and I look at it until it begins to shine. Bring me the sunset in a cup, she also said. The past remains for writers, poets, ordinary or extraordinary people to dig up those memories, find the right words to add meaning to all our lives. Two other moments from the House of Crows as a small boy went out in the neighborhood to play after dinner. The home when the street lights go on, caution the mother. And when that same small boy, only child, turned the latch turned the key kid, whose parents both worked, mother nights, father days, when that small child climbed into bed at night, feeling so all by himself in that house. Echoes of his father's voice hovered in their bedroom to his. Turn off the light. Don't be afraid of the dark. <coughs> I'm reminded that Hemingway, in the old age, still slept with a light on. Light, dark, the shadow of poetry. It follows 